All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning to all of you here in Tremont, and good morning to those of you on the simulcast in different locations across the country. I'm happy to have you this morning. We're excited about what we get to share with you um, here on this third day of Winter Conference. Uh, my name is Bryce Baker. You'll also hear from Justin McMenemy here in this session this morning. Uh, you know, for 25 years now, Precision Planning has been talking about how the planner pass is the most important pass, the most important pass across the field every year. Obviously, every pass matters, but the planner pass is the most important, and we want to get that planner pass right. And so when we see stands that look like this, no matter the crop, you know, here we see corn, sugar beets, cotton, so no matter what crop we're planting, we want to make sure we get that planner pass right. We can be proud of these stands, and we know they're profitable. So that's the first thing we want to do is get it right. But we also want it to be as easy as possible to get that, pl that planner pass right. Some of us have very different opinions on what making it easy or have it, having the planner pass be easy actually means. Right? There's some of us that are sitting here that say, the latest technology that I can get makes it as easy as possible. Now, right beside that person might be someone else, maybe even from the same operation, the same farm that says the opposite. Actually, as little technology as I can possibly have actually makes it easy because technology is complicated. Technology is complicated and makes it difficult to get things done. And we'll talk about technology today, and we'll talk about how that actually does make it easy in a lot of cases. But then there's a third aspect as well, which is our profitability and cost. We want to get it right as easy as possible and for the lowest cost. We, uh, you know, a lot of us... Uh, at these different locations that you're viewing from today, left your families at home to come visit and, and spend a day with us. And we appreciate that, but we know that your business seems to be profitable, you have a family, um, and you want to support them as well. And so these are the things we want, we want to get right, or we want to get it right as easy as possible for the lowest cost. So I'm going to focus on three things this morning to get right. There's obviously many more than three things, um, but we'll talk about three of them. Measuring agronomic performance is the first one. The soil, the seed, and equipment, and the interaction of those three things. Second is correct downforce settings across the, across the planter. You know, for many years, there was minimal visibility to downforce settings, and we set it, hoped it was right, and it was just a guess. But now we don't have to guess anymore. And then third is for singulated crops, getting 99 plus percent singulation as easy as we possibly can. And so many of us then, when we see these three things, think about how do we get them right? We say, if you're not getting those right, maybe I need to get a different planter in, in order to be able to achieve these things. So let's talk about equipment for a little bit. Let's talk about reasons why it would make sense to get a new to you or even a new planter. The first would be changing the number of rows. So that's easiest. The easiest way to do that is by getting a different machine. Second would be changing row spacing. So here we see 20 inch rows and 30 inch rows. So if you're changing row spacing, it makes sense to get a different machine. That's the easiest way to do that. And then third would be if you're going to a central fill planter for the convenience of the central fill or away from central fill to boxes to spread out weight. That's easiest done with a new machine. And so there might be a fourth way, and it would potentially be this oops factor. So we hope this doesn't happen, but this is probably a fourth reason. Probably change your planner and your pants when you get done with this incident. Um, I know I would. But as we think about equipment and we think about the cost, the costs are not going down. I just want to look at these two machines, these two planners, and, and compare them. So what's the same about these two planners? Well, they're both 16-row, 30-inch planners, central fill system with markers. Right? What's different? Well, the model year is different. And the technology is different. And so I ran some numbers a couple weeks ago on a 12, a 16, 24, and 36-row planter and basically said to retrofit precision planting control technology onto those machines, what's the cost? And then I went to different OEM manufacturer websites and some toolbar manufacturers and figured out what does it cost to just buy a brand new planter equipped the same way? And I want to look at what portion of that total cost of a new planter would be the technology versus the iron and other components. So I took the precision planting price divided by the total new planter price. And so that this, the category which is non-technology, so toolbar markers, row units, central fill, hydraulic hoses, those types of things, on average across multiple manufacturers made up 73% of the cost of a new planter. 
So what that means is if we trade that planner on the left, a 2010 model year, for a new planner, the one on the right, 73 cents out of every dollar spent to trade is actually to rebuy things you already owned. So you already own markers for a 16-year-old planner, 73 cents out of every dollar buys me new markers, buys me new hydraulic hoses, buys me new tires, new wheels, new central fill tanks, which leaves 27% as actually being the technology, right? So 27 cents out of every dollar is on the technology, which is actually one of the two things that changed. And you know, the planner is different than many other pieces of equipment. There's a lot of pieces of equipment on the farm that you probably do need to trade in given scenarios. And so as we think about tractors, if we want to go from front wheel assist to articulated track, well, that takes a different machine. If we have a, a 500 horsepower four wheel drive and we want to go to a 500 horsepower row crop tractor, it takes a new machine. If we want to change from a power shift to a CVT transmission, it takes a different machine. Combines, if I want to trade out of this combine because I've run it for a few years, it's got a lot of wear, there's a lot of friction, high RPMs, a lot of moving parts, it makes sense to actually trade that machine and get a different one. Even tillage tools have high draft loads, especially rippers, fall tillage tools, high draft loads, and the frame takes a significant amount of stress. But you think about the planter, the frame of the planter takes a minimal amount of stress. Everything's rolling. The actual draft load on a planter frame isn't that high. And so a lot of times, and you may have even done this, some of you take an older planter frame that's still great, pull the row units off and make it a strip till rig or a strip freshener, something of that nature. And that's because the frame is still in good shape. All right? And so the planter doesn't get near as much wear and doesn't need traded like these other systems do. You say, well, but there is wear on a planter. It's in the row units. I agree. Row unit maintenance, very, very important. We see bushings and bolts that look like this. We've got to get some maintenance done on those. And some people would say, well, but if I run it a few years, it needs some maintenance. I just want a different one. Some say, well, I'll do the maintenance. But at some point, potentially, you have this kind of an issue that occurs where this row unit's actually cracked. It's a steel row unit. It's cracked, it's, it's reached the end of its effective life. Does that take a new planter? Not necessarily. Let's think about this a little bit. What if we took these row units on this planter, pulled them off, had a bare frame that was in great shape, and we added new row units, like this precision planting ready row unit. A new row unit can be bolted on to the existing frame that's in good shape. All new components, new bearings, bushings, new bolts, everything's in good shape, ready to go significant cost savings, and basically build a planter that is exactly what you want rather than buying one that's new. And then when we look at the economics of this and we add row units in with the technology, then the percentage of the cost on the left side that would be like that toolbar plus central fill system is 57% still of the total cost, and the technology plus that row unit is 43%. So still, by retrofitting, Significant cost savings over buying new. And that's exactly what happened in this planner. This is a planner um, from a precision planning premier dealer, uh, Precision Ag Systems in Western Iowa. They took a 24-row planner, took the older row units off. The frame was in great shape. Central fill was fine. Put new row units on, new technology. Got the planner they wanted and did it for a significant cost savings. And they were able to get planting right. With that planter, they were able to get all three of these things right. So as we think about getting it right, you know, you see this toolbox. Many of you probably have a toolbox like this, and you know that the power of this toolbox is actually not the toolbox. It's the tools that you have inside of it. And the power of a planter is not necessarily the iron. It's the technology that puts the seed in the ground and helps you actually get it right. So let's talk about some of this technology that helps us get it right and talk about that 27% that, that of the cost of a new planter. You know, it was a year ago <clears throat> that uh, at, at this very event, Precision Planning announced the 2020 Gen 3 display. And it's been out there for a year. And I want to show you um, what that looks like and what that display looks like. Um, what's, what's up here is a simulation of a 10-inch display. Uh, for those of you here in Tremont, you can see a 16-inch display when, when we're done um, over here as well that we'll be testing this spring. So the 2020 is the... the thing that gives us agronomic performance of seed, equipment, and soil. And so we look up here, we see in the upper left, population. 
So how many seeds are we planting per acre? And then right below that, singulation. We want to get singulation right, that 99 plus percent for singulated crops. So I can see we're above 99 percent. That's with a VSAT meter that's doing that. If we touch on singulation, now we can see the singulation of every row. And anywhere we see a bar, there's skips or multiples or both occurring. If we touch on that bar, now we can see every seed. Across the bottom here, it's showing us basically every seed that goes past the sensor, either good, skip, or multiple. So I know, I see that agronomic picture of seed. All right, what about equipment? Well, one of the, the things um, that this shows with regards to equipment is about downforce. It's an equipment measurement. You see that in the bottom left, ground contact and margin. We can also see some of this performance graphically in a, in a map. So here in the center of the screen, we see we have a population map. And see, see it's being mapped as we plant. If I zoom out, you can see there's the field we're in. We planted a static population so far. We know what it is. What about singulation? Here's a map of singulation. We can see where, where we're planting correctly and where any skips or multiples are occurring. And it helps us uh, pick up any patterns. So seed, equipment, what about soil? Well, the next session that you hear with uh, Dale Cook, we'll talk about some tools to help you actually measure the soil and sense the agronomic performance of the soil that you're planting into as well. So this is technology that's cool, I can see a lot, but it's gotta be Easy, it's got to be difficult to use. Some of you are going to say that. Well, technology is always difficult. So let's just talk about some ease of use things here. So when it comes to getting ready for the spring, every year some people fight getting their displays ready. And they say, I need to update software. Well, how do we do that here with the, the Gen 3 display? Well, you could do it on a USB stick, but there's also something that's been added to the Generation 3 this year. And I'm going to touch in the upper right corner. And then this second box here says Wi-Fi connectivity. So all Gen 3s can be connected to Wi-Fi. And that would typically be done in the form of a mobile hotspot. So a smart device, a phone, or a tablet that you might have in the cab. So if we were connected to my phone here, it would say Bryce's iPhone. We're connected to the wireless network in the building right now. Say, OK, it can connect to Wi-Fi. Cool, but it has to do something for me. Well, let's talk about that getting ready for the spring and software updates. If we go to Setup and then data, and then software update, right here, instead of worrying about which USB I put my software update on and did I download it correctly and so on, I just touch that second box from the top, update, update that display, and it's ready to roll. All right, so very easy, very simple to use. What else? When we connect to Wi-Fi, there's also another feature that's just in the view and, and usability of the display that I really like. And it has to do with the display. So I'll go into the uh, display settings here. And over to the right, you see the background map style, and it says grid. Right? I'm going to touch that box. And now we see we have two choices here, either grid or because we have that, that connection to our hotspot in the cab, we can select satellite image. Now when we go back home and zoom out, we see a very different picture than what we saw before. Here we can see that satellite image is loaded. We can see we're about 25 miles uh, to the southwest of Tremont, Illinois. There's some sandy soils down there. You can see the irrigation circles here. Actually, just to the south, just below this field, you can actually see some features in the, uh, in the topography of the earth, like soil type changes and so on. And so then if you saw actually maybe changes in the applied downforce map that was on top of some of these topography changes, you would actually see those lining up. It's just a, a very different view than the grid. Then you also have the ability to change the tilt and the angle of this map. Right now we're overhead. We can tilt the map and get a different view, and we can tilt it a little bit steeper here and actually see a different view. So just a, a different look, a different feel than that grid, and, and really enhances um, you, the time you spend in the cab. Now it looks like we're starting to have some trouble here on, on a row with uh, some singulation errors. So if we look at the map, we see we got a lot of skips and multiples start to occur. Our singulation box here on the left turned yellow. So we just happen to be at the end of the field. We're at the end row here. So let's go ahead and, and we would stop. We'd have to go actually check out row three because it was on row three. So right now we're stopped. We're not doing what we should. Let's walk over here to the planter. This would be like we're walking, get out of the cab, walk back. We go to row three. We're going to pull off the meter. We're going to pull off the hopper, take that meter apart, see what's going on. Is it the seed tube sensor? We're going to figure that out. It just happens to be that in this case on row three, here's what was in the meter. Anybody ever had that experience? In the last three years, I've uh, helped Agco 
uh, plant some, some different agronomic trials, and three out of three years we found debris in the meter and caught it exactly like that. And so now we've, fi- we've got that issue fixed. We take this, uh, s- the top of the seed bag out. We put the meter together. We're ready to go. We, we latch the hopper back. We walk back to the cab. We've wasted a few minutes here when we should be planting. We start to plant again, and guess what? There's still a problem. Now I'm not planting at all. So what do I do? I waste more time going back to the back of the planter. It's too bad I couldn't have verified that row three was fine before we get back in the cab. Well, we can. I want to show you something that, that's exciting here called the 2020 Connect app. So we've got a phone here. So this is an app that could be put on a phone or a tablet, and it would connect to the display, the Gen 3 display, through Wi-Fi. So you've got to be within range, Wi-Fi range of the display. But you can actually see and do some functions remotely here on the phone or the tablet when you're uh, at the back of the planter. So here we can see some diagnostic pages. You could also do some health checks. But right now, I just want to run some system commands. I just want to verify I've got that V-Drive motor plugged in, and it's going to spin the meter. So I'm going to select here in the middle. I'm going to select meter spin. Now I'm going to swipe up on these two switches. And for those of you in Tremont, you'll actually hear these meters turning. All right, so right there, we're commanding from this phone the meters to turn. If we were over, we look at row three. It looks like it's, it's working well. If we had the vacuum on in this planter, we would actually then be able to load the meter back with seed if we had pulled off the vacuum hose. So there they spin again. We're loaded with seed. I verified now from the back of the planter with one trip. Everything's good to go. We're ready. Now I get back in the cab, start planting, and let's see if we've fixed our problem. We go back over here to the 2020. Yep, looks like we're good to go with just that one trip. We didn't have to make that second trip. So really convenient, just saves us a lot of time. Let's talk about downforce a little bit now, that second thing we want to get right. You know, for years and years it was, man, where do I set springs, where do I set airbags? I make an educated guess and I go and probably don't account for variability in the field. We don't have to anymore. For the last six years now, Delta Force has been on the marketplace in hundreds of thousands of rows of Delta Force across the, across the globe are getting it right for growers automatically by measuring and adjusting downforce on every single row. How easy is it to use the Delta Force system? Well, in the bottom left, we see this downforce box. There's margin and then ground contact. So margin is telling us, do we have too much weight? Are we creating compaction? Ground contact is basically saying, are we planting at the depth we've set? If that was, say, 80% ground contact, 20% of our seeds would be shallow, probably in dry soil, not in the moisture needed for germination. We can also look at a downforce map here on the screen. Any blue squares would correlate to losing ground contact. We don't see many of those. All the others indicate how much weight is carried on the gauge wheels, and that's what Delta Force is controlling. So let's say we got out and dug, and we said, eh, it seems like we're at depth all the time, but we could possibly be a little bit lighter. I want to make a change. I'd like to go from 100 pounds, which we see over here on the right side in Delta Force, custom 100 pounds. I want to drop that to 80. I knew when I got in this field it was maybe a little too wet. I want to change this to 80. I'm going to push and hold on that Delta Force box, hit the minus button twice. I just changed my gauge wheel target by 20 pounds down to 80. I adjusted for the conditions very, very easily right from the cab. Got it done. And so I want you to hear now from a grower who's used Delta Force and talk about his experience with the product. The product that we added to this planner that gave us the most value came actually as the biggest surprise uh, was the Delta Force. We had airbags, we always went out and dug, we checked for seed slice compaction, we thought we were pretty much on top of this, but just seeing the variability through the field. We go from sandy ridges to heavy bottoms. Uh, We have places in the field where we drove in to fix sprinkler tracks and seeing how quickly that machine can take a reading from that load pin and transfer it to an almost instantaneous increase or decrease in pressure as it's needed and keep that seed at a perfectly uniform depth. Uh, It was really surprising how much better that made our emergence, how much more even. Delta Force to achieve that perfect ground contact and not have the unit skip and hop across the ground and lose ground contact. Uh, 
like I said, it was the biggest surprise, but that was the product that uh, I wouldn't want to be without right now. And so you hear from Aaron there a sentiment held by a lot of growers that we talked to over the years. So they didn't realize without the measurement of, of downforce just how variable their fields were. And after using Delta Force, they wouldn't want to plant without it. Now let's talk about this third area you want to get right, 99 plus percent singulation. And that's talking about the, the crops that we singulate. Some crops we plant at very high populations and we're not really able to measure singulation. So for crops like corn, cotton, sugar beets, sorghum, we can singulate those very well. And you see all these different discs that go in the V-set meter that would work for different types of crops like canola, wheat, soybeans, peanuts, edible beans, and, and such. And V-set makes it simple to get that 99 plus percent singulation for those singulated crops. And the proof is really in the field performance here. So we can see here with sunflowers, a, a field at 99 percent. Then we see cotton, one planter the whole the whole year, 99.7% singulation. And then here at the bottom, corn, 11 different planters, 7 different states, 11 operators, the average singulation, 994 And the reason why this singulation number was able to be achieved in all these different crops was because of the way the V-set works. Put in the right crop kit, set your vacuum, and it's not sensitive to seed size and shape. And you don't have to continually make adjustments. And then when we take the agronomic power and performance of V-set and tie it with V-drive, makes it really easy to get swath control right. So we're not having overlap. And this picture up here can easily be achieved in your fields without hours and hours of digging and, and dialing in uh, the swath control. Then we think about drive systems. And you know, when I think about drive systems, there's not only this poor stand, but I also think about time. Because you know, in my 10 years of precision planning, every call I've taken that ends up being a drive system issue always costs somebody time. It's time fixing a bearing, it's time adjusting the alignment of a hex shaft, it's a dealer going to the field to diagnose what was wrong with that planter. And so you can see here on the left side we got a uh, set screw digging into a parallel arm. And when we think about time, there's time spent farming, there's time spent with family. And I think about, you know, in the opening video this morning, uh, there was a, a classmate of mine from high school and he's got five children. If he wants to get done planting, get to his daughter's softball game that night, and he told her he would be there, but then he finds this problem, he's got to make a time decision. Do I fix the issue, finish the field, disappoint my daughter, but get the field done? Or do I make the softball game, but not get the field done, potentially get rained out? Those trade-offs are gone with V-Drive because the set screw is gone, and the drive system on the planter is gone, and we get our time back, plus get stands that look like that because we get a smooth drive system all the time with the V-Drive system. And then there's also setting population. So from a ground drive, we have to find our rate chart, we have to find the drive and the driven sprocket, and that's complicated. There's a lot, of, a lot of wear parts just in that picture, just on that transmission. And so how easy is it with V-Drive, an electric motor on every row, to set population? As we look back here at the 2020, we see on the right side, Right above the Delta Force box is V-Drive. Right now we're planning 32,000. I want to go to 34,000. I'm going to push and hold on the V-Drive box. You see this little widget pops up. I'm going to hit plus 500 four times. Then touch away from there. We just changed our population by 2,000 seeds per acre. I didn't have to leave the screen that was giving me my agronomic performance picture, but I easily made that change in just a few seconds. So when we think about what we want to do here with getting it right, making it easy, and doing it for the lowest cost, the lowest cost is by retrofitting, retrofitting the planter that you have. The easiest way is honestly through technology and precision planting technology like what we've talked about that makes it easy to get it right. So think about for 2019 what tools you want to fill your planter with to, to manage those three things. Last thing we're going to uh, do here is we're going to hear from Mark Besner, who's a grower in Texas, and he's going to give a recommendation on where to start with technology as well as his experience. I guess for someone that, that doesn't have anything uh, on their planner at all, I think the first step would be the uh, 2020 monitor. It was a nice platform to start off with. We had a, a a used planter that had done a, a decent job for us for a long time, we were able to convert that into a state-of-the-art planter that had basically every bell and whistle you could put on it um, without having to trade the entire machine off. 
I think it uh, it made more uh, more sense to to us to to go that route um, financially than trading it off and and, and um, buying a, a complete new planter. So getting it right, getting this planter pass right, as easy as possible with the lowest cost. Three things we want to do right. We've talked about technologies to do that. Justin is going to come up and talk to us about some new ways and some new agronomic research to help us get it right. Good morning. How's everybody doing today? Welcome to Tremont and welcome everybody that's watching through the, the simulcast. You know, it's been over the last couple weeks that I've been really just thinking about how much technology has changed our operations over the not very long period of time. And in fact, I was home over Christmas break and, and my dad and I were talking about that. And because it's Christmas break, you got a little bit extra time. And so, so what we decided to do is to go down in the basement and start rooting through some of the, the old family photos. And we came across these two pictures here. And up in the, the top right here is a picture of my great grandfather and my two great uncles putting in the corn crop of 1925. And so they've got a tripwire IH planter there, and uh, they're, they're putting the crop in. Now, my dad told me, um, not a lot of horsepower here, but if you're going to chip it, you don't come in from behind, okay? <laughs> you got to come in from the side when you're going to chip these up, okay? So that was one lesson that I learned. Uh, this other photo here that we found, it, not, it's also my great-grandfather and my two great-uncles, and that is the DeKalb yield-winning crop of 1943. And so they took that photo to show off those baseball bats for us. And I tried to do a kernel count to get a yield check on, my, uh, on the, the, the cob there. Couldn't quite count them out. And so if you guys had a guess, let's take some stabs here. What do you think the DeKalb yield-winning corn crop of 1943 would have been? If you had to guess in bushel. We got a 40. Get a 60, can I get an 80? Sold at 80, right? No, so we, we didn't know, and so we had to dig through about 10 more boxes, but we actually found the plaque that you get in 1943 for being a DeKalb yield winner. 109 bushel. That's not too bad, right? So when we look at these photos and we think about our operations over the last decades, the last generations, they're... There's a ton of things that have changed. But the reality is, is there's actually a few things that haven't changed very much at all. If we think about this picture on the right, my great-grandfather and that 10-year-old boy right there, my great-uncle standing on the wheel, what depth do you think he taught him to plant his corn at in 1925? The second knuckle, right? He taught him the second knuckle. And I think that everybody else's great-grandfather was teaching their great-uncles the second knuckle. And if we think about the corn crop of 2018 and 2019, where do you think that most of that corn is going in on depth? That same second knuckle, right? When we think about the depth conversation, there are, in this room alone, there's going to be a lot of different opinions. There's going to be guys that lean toward the shallower side of the conversation, and they're going to talk about warming up soil and getting, getting temperature into that seed. And they're going to talk about speed to emergence. And then there's other guys in this same room that are going to lean towards the deeper side of the conversation. And they're going to talk about the need to get to even moisture or the need to have the temperature be more stable across the day and the night. But the reality is, is for most of that conversation, it's a philosophical debate. There's very little information that we have about our farm and our fields to help to inform that decision. It's mostly about opinions and, and what we learned when we were sitting on the five-gallon bucket before they had buddy seats growing up, right? And so in this discussion, there are a lot of seeding depth studies that you can go out and, and look up. And so I did that, there's about 40 of them. All the universities, all the extensions, many of the seed companies have them. And you can read through all these seeding depth studies. And, and there's things you can learn from those seeding depth studies. A couple of things that I took out of it is the most common cause of uneven emergence in corn is dry soil. And so we think about wanting to hit that emergence window where everything's up in that 24 to 36 hour window. And what we learn is one of the biggest reasons for fields to have uneven emergence 
is that we did not plant into uniform moisture. But we also see that every soil and every environment is different. And that we should check our corn seeding depths when we enter fields or change soils or change tillage practices. So you get done reading, you've used up your whole highlighter, you get done reading all these, these studies, and what you find out is kind of what you knew at the beginning. Moisture matters and moisture varies. And so even after all this reading, you're really largely left with guess and check when it comes to picking a seeding depth for our crop. Now last year, as we came out with Smart Firmer, we took just a little bit of the guess out of it. We started to take some of the guess out of that conversation. And there were many growers that put Smart Firmers on their planter and for the first time were able to, be, able to get a row by row, foot by foot moisture and temperature map right at their seeding depth. And one of the stories we heard, and, and, and we heard many of them, but one of them that's one of my favorite comes from Holly Bluff, Mississippi. And there's a farmer there, Smith Stoner. He put smart firmers on his planter last year. And, and in this day, in this evening, he was coming in to plant the pasture. And he knows this field. He's planted this field for most of his life. So he knows the DNA of this field. And there's a culvert that runs east to west. And north of the culvert is a light sand. And south of the culvert, we get into some buckshot clay. And he knows that in general, that sand is not going to hold on to moisture nearly as well as that buckshot clay will. So he comes in in 2018, he starts planting, and he's looking at his smart firmer moisture map, and the smart firmer moisture map is telling him a different story. The smart firmer moisture map is telling him that he's planting into moisture in the sand, but he's not planting into moisture into that buckshot clay. But when he looks out the rear window of the tractor at the treads on the tire, he sees that there's mud on the tires as he drives through that buckshot clay. So something's not lining up. The tires are telling him that he's got moisture, but the smart firmer's telling him that he doesn't. Now, the one thing that Smith had in the cab with him also was Matt Morgan. You guys may not know Matt Morgan. He's an engineer that's worked on smart firmer for about four years. And so Matt's sitting in the buddy seat saying, man, we got to get out and dig. We got to get out and dig and figure out what's going on here. So they get out and they dig and they're digging in the clay. And sure enough, they get down to four or five inches and they find moisture. Where's the tire tread going when it comes through the clay? It's finding that moisture at four or five inches, isn't it? But as they're digging at the seeding depth, they don't see moisture. And so Matt makes the recommendation and says, hey, let's go down a half a notch. Let's plant a half a notch deeper. So we're amongst friends here. Got a question for you. If an engineer is sitting in the buddy seat with you when you're planting corn and he makes the recommendation that you should go down a half a notch, so let's be honest, who's going to listen to him? I usually get about five. Now, what you guys do not know is how persuasive Matt Morgan is. So they did. They went down a half a notch, and they put about 10 more acres. And you can see in both the sand and the clay, we're moving into moisture. So the sand moves from the oranges into the greens, and the buckshot clay moves from the reds into the oranges. Matt's saying, man, we're still not into moisture. We're still not into moisture. We should get out and dig. Now, that's about the time an engineer starts to wear out his welcome in the buddy seat. Is that not right? We already dug this field. It's time to plant corn. Why are we getting out and digging again? But he does. They get out and they dig, and they still, Matt still doesn't feel like we're planting into moisture. So he makes the recommendation, let's go down another half notch. Now, there were only five of you guys that listened the first time, so of you five guys, engineer in the buddy seat says, let's go down a half a notch. It's the second one in like 30 minutes. Who's going down the second notch with us? We got one, right? Again, Matt is a very persuasive person. So they finish out the evening planting a half inch deeper in this field than they have been in the past, than where that T-handle sat all year. Right at the end of the evening, as they come, they're folding up the planter, wrapping up for the evening. Smith Stoner, the owner, comes down the road to talk and see how it went through the day. And they're showing the maps, and they're talking about the digging, and they're talking about the discussion. And Smith, the owner, he says, you know, 
I really think that smart firmers paid for themselves in this field tonight. Now, that's a bold statement. And it's not really a statement you can back up until four months later when you come back through that same field with the combine and yield sense. And so as they came through this field with the combine, what we saw is that first setting, the T-handle setting they started the field with, 246 bushel. That's not too bad, right? So we made a half notch change. We went down a quarter inch for the next 10 acres, and we saw a five bushel increase by getting into more moisture, by getting into more uniform moisture. We made that second notch change. We went down a full half inch, and what we saw is on this field, on this day, there was a 16 bushel increase to plant from two inches down to two and a half inches and get into that uniform moisture. Again, this is the same genetics, the same planting date, the same nutrient program, the same weather, everything else is the same, and we were a half an inch away from a 16 bushel increase. And Smith Stoner was not that far off the night of planting because at a 16 bushel increase, you're able to pay for a smart firmer every 10 acres. And so he about bought the whole set of smart firmers in this field this evening because he looked at his moisture map and he made the adjustment to his planter to plant into moisture. As we remember from that study, the most common cause of uneven emergence for corn is planting into dry soil. And this is a question that we've been really wrestling with for a number of years. And it really dates back as far as three years ago to 2016. And this predates even the development of a product or even talking about designing a product. For us, it's really about understanding the answer to these types of questions before we start developing a product at all. And the question for us is, is uniform emergence driven more by consistent depth or is it driven more by sufficient moisture? And so in 2016, we started in the lab. And what you do is you start with a tray of soil. You, you get it to a certain moisture, and you put 100 seeds in it. And then you put soil on top so that it's a certain depth. And you start a stopwatch, and you wait till emergence. Now, you don't just do one tray. You do 30 trays. So you have different soils, different moistures, uh, and different depths. And what we found in 2016 in this study is that if you plant corn, into adequate moisture, so that 30% furrow moisture. When we see 30% furrow moisture on the smart firmer, that is enough moisture in the soil to germinate that seed in the next 72 hours. And so when we planted into adequate moisture, we were able to change the planting depth by a full inch, from inch and a half to two and a half inches, and we only saw a 17 hour difference in emergence. We were still within that 24 to 36 hour emergence window that gives us the highest yield potential. So really what we started to take away from this study three years ago is that uniform emergence starts with uniform germination. And germination is primarily driven off of moisture and temperature, not necessarily off of depth. But now, you, none of you and none of us farm in the lab, right? And there's been plenty of good ideas in the lab that when they got out to the real world, what happened? They fell flat on their face. And so that's what we've been doing for the last couple years is to get out of the lab and get into the field. And, and any of you guys that have put in yield trials or put in plots, you know that it takes an army. It takes an army of people to plant it. It takes an army to plant it to scout it, to combine it, and then also to come through and look at the data afterwards. And that's really, for the last many years, we've had an army of interns, agronomists, engineers, product managers, farmers, farm hands, dealers helping us and, and looking at plots so we can take this understanding out of the lab and get it into the field. This last year, in 2018, we put in about 300 acres of depth plots. We came back through after emergence and categorized just under a half million plants. And then we came back through with the combine and we weighed just about 350 passes. So what I want to do is I want to talk about what we've been finding in the field. And we're going to talk about three different uh, soil types. Di different, different soil types. Yeah, that's a good word for it. 
but it's not the soil type when we think of clays and loam. We're thinking about the density of the top few inches of our soil profile. So we're going to talk about a loose soil, we're going to talk about a tight soil, and then we're going to talk about an optimal soil. And really an optimal soil is when we have a good uniform density of that soil coming up through the seeding zone, right? Coming up through those top four or five inches. And what we found this year is as we planted fields that had an optimal soil, by and large, that 30% furrow moisture line is going to sit between an inch and a half and two and a half inches. Now, if we plant shallower than that optimal depth window, we actually don't have adequate moisture. So we're going to have uneven germination that's going to lead to uneven emergence that's going to cost us in yield potential. Now, if we go south, if we go deeper than the optimal depth window, we start to pay a tax. And that tax is the resistance to emergence. As you guys know, the only energy that the seed has to get to the surface, to the surface is what he brung with him, right? Until he gets to the sun and we start photosynthesis, only what he brought in that seed is what he can do to get to the surface. And so as we go deeper, it's going to take more energy to get to the surface, and we can actually cost ourselves in yield potential. And when we came through and we planted a number of fields, this year, an example of Ackerman 47, we planted it on May 2nd. And on May 2nd, with Smart Firmer, we were able to see that that 30% furrow moisture line was at that inch and a half of depth. We had enough moisture at an inch and a half to germinate the seed. We came back through after, uh, after emergence and did a stand count looking at yield potential. And what we saw is that in an optimal soil, there really isn't that much of a penalty. There's very similar yield potential between an inch and a half and two inches and two and a half inches. And this lines up very similarly with other published data that's out there in the industry. But when we think about this field, when we think about Ackerman 47, if we come back and we plant it in 2019, and for whatever reason, the weather's different, or for whatever reason, it's later in the season that we get to, get to this field, what if that moisture line is actually next year sitting at two inches rather than an inch and a half? We would expect that next year, that inch and a half planting depth, that yield potential would drop down because we will not have adequate moisture at that inch and a half to germinate to give us even emergence to maximize the yield potential. As we talk about a, a loose soil, again, we, there's some of that aspect that is the soil type, but there's as much of it is what we're doing to the soil. So our tillage practice, or what, how wet it was when we tilled, those types of things could take a soil type that would typically be ideal, and it could actually make it act like a loose soil as we come through this year. In these loose soils, we're going to have a lot more oxygen in the top layer that's going to dry out the top layer of the soil. And so what we actually see is that optimal depth window moves deeper to that two and three quarter into maybe three and a quarter inch depth. So shallower than that optimal depth window, again, we're going to have inadequate moisture, so we're not going to have even germination. If we go deeper than the optimal depth window, we still have the same resistance to emergence, but it sits lower in the profile because we don't have the same density of the soil. The seed doesn't have to fight as hard for each quarter inch to get out of the ground. So we planted a field, and in fact, it's the field that sits right behind us in our R&D. Now, typically, the R&D field would fall into the category of an ideal soil. But in 2018, we ran the finishing pass on April 23rd. We didn't get the planter into the field until April 27th. Now, I know that has never happened in any of your operations, but I just wanted to show you what would happen if for, for some reason it does, right? So on April 27th, as we came through the R&D field out back, that moisture line was actually sitting lower than two and a half inches. Those four days had dried out the, tops, the top of the profile, and that moisture line had moved down below two and a half inches. So we came back after emergence, and we scouted the field. And what we saw is that 
similar to what we were expecting, is that as you move out of moisture, you're going to cost yourself in emergence, which is to cost yourself in yield potential. Because we didn't get even germination at the shallower planting depth. So we come back to this field with the combine, and we look at the difference between planting this field in 2018 with the T-handles at two inches versus adjusting to plant into moisture. And on this field, there was an 18 bushel difference between leaving the T-handles at two inches and adjusting the T-handles to plant into moisture. That was the cost of uneven germination in 2018 in the field behind us. As we move to a tighter soil, again, this, this, the tight soil could be defined by the type of soil it is, like a clay, but it could also be a no-till field. Or it could be the section of our field that has the most traffic on it. We could have the most compaction, the, the headlands, for instance. So it's not just that one of these is a field and a field and a field. These are sections and these are feet of every given field that are loose or tight or ideal. In a tight soil, we don't have the oxygen in the top few inches, and so that moisture line is able to wick much higher in the profile, and we see in the tighter soils, the optimal depth window actually sits more in that inch and a half to two and, two and a quarter inches of depth. Now, we do not recommend planting our corn shallower than an inch and a half because you don't give the seed time to develop its root structure before emergence. And you can get into standability issues, you can get into some rootless corn issues. And so that, that, that window sits there at that inch and a half and works its way down. You see that resistance to emergence is much larger in the tighter soil. Because we have such a tight soil, that seed has to fight harder to get out. And so a shallower depth is going to cost you more in, in resistance to emergence. So we look at some fields we planted this year that were, that were no-till, that were uh, a tighter soil. And when we planted this field, Depert 1, on April 26th, we knew with Smart Firmer that there was enough moisture at one inch to germinate the seed in 72 hours. But like we said, we don't want to plant our corn shallower than an inch and a half. Now, we didn't tell Deppert, but we're doing a study, so we had to plant the corn shallower than an inch and a half. And so when we, it was for your benefit, really, is what it was. So when we look at the data that we get after emergence, we see both curves. We see the cost of resistance to emergence as we go deeper and deeper, and we see the cost of not giving the seed enough time to develop its root structure. And so in this field, the ideal planting depth ended up being an inch and a half. We came back through with the combine and the difference between a two inch T-handle setting and planting into moisture but more than an inch and a half in this field was 10 bushel. So if we summarize our findings over the last couple years, what we've really found is that depending on the soil structure, depending on the density of that soil, is where the moisture line is going to sit. And ultimately what we found to maximize even germination for maximum uh, emergence to give ourselves the most yield potential is to plant at greater than an inch and a half into that 30% furrow moisture. Over the last couple years, we've been working on a lot of planters, and we, you know, when you're running a depth plot, you've got to make sure that every row is exactly the same depth. And what we've learned also over the last couple years is that you can take out a brand new set of gauge wheel arms, opening discs, and mustaches, and they look exactly the same to each other. You put them on the planter, you shim everything right, and then you measure the depth from row to row, and you can have a half an inch of difference. Just from this planter right here, you're a half inch of difference between one row and the next. So you set that T-handle to two inches, but you've got rows at inch and three quarter. You've got other rows at, at two and a quarter inches. This last year, we were working with Parkland College down in southern Illinois, and we were putting in some corn plots, and we were putting in some bean plots. So they put in a bean plot, and they go back the next week to, to look at it and, 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 and start scouting it, and the scout takes this photograph. You can see we've got really bad emergence here. Now, just a, a word to the wise or a lesson that we learned. If you put in a plot and you show up and this is what you see, you're researching something different this year than you thought you were researching. You've got to figure out what you're researching, but you're not researching what you thought you were. So they start digging row one. This is row one. We go down, we come back, row one. 
Um, and the soybeans are there. Every bean is there. They're swollen, but not germinated. They're all there. They're swollen, but they're not germinated. And they were planted shallower. So we go back to the shed and we start measuring these four rows. And what we found is that row one was at the same T-handle setting was five-eighths of an inch shallower than rows two, three, and four. So on this day in this field, we were planting into moisture in rows two, three, and four, but row one did not have enough moisture to germinate the seed to get to emergence. And so what we're left with is a bunch of shallow, swollen soybeans while the rest of the crop is off to the races. How many have calibrated a planter before for depth? We got a few, right? It's a fun game, right? If you got a son or a good farm hand, it's really easy to do, actually. If you don't, you're going to be lifting and lowering the planter for most of the day, and you're going to be spending about half the day on your belly button, right? And, and it is not fun to calibrate the planter. And there's a hit list of things you got to get done before planting, and it's often easy to watch calibrating the planter depth. Just keep moving down the list and down the list and down the list, right? When we talk about a product development, even before we really start developing the product, it, for us, we want to understand where can it deliver value? Where can it fit into an operation? We do not ever want to be in a situation where we're designing a motor because it fits there. That's, that's a silly reason to design a product. When we thought about and we're thinking about depth, for us, it really falls into uniformity. Each row, when we set it to two inches, should be at two inches. If moisture is at two inch, we want every seed at two inch. And adjustability, rather than having to get out of the tractor, bust your shin on the marker, and adjust 24 T handles, we want the ability to adjust it from the cab. But really, the agronomy side is what gets us really excited as well. When we can take the knowledge from our research and the knowledge that you have of your operation and combine those together, to put more bushels to the bottom line. And so Justin Kaufman announced this morning, and we're going to show off here in a minute, Smart Depth. And really what Smart Depth is, it's, it's an electric motor that replaces the T-handle. And that gives us the ability to calibrate our planter from our feet rather than our belly button. And it also gives us the ability to adjust from inside the cab. But the part that we get really excited about is when we can combine the knowledge of smart firmer, that moisture and that temperature map with smart depth and take what you guys know agronomically and what our research is showing agronomically and combine them automatically on the planner. So we're going to spend a little bit of time here. We're going to talk about smart depth and we're going to show off some of what it can do. So rather than adjusting this planner's depth and calibrating out the rotor row variability from our belly button, we're going to do it from our cell phone. So we're going to use this 2020 Connect app that Bryce showed us, and we're going to go to Health Checks. We're going to come down here, and we're going to go to Smart Depth Calibration. Now, we went to Menards, and we bought 2x4s. So our depth calibration we're going to calibrate to is an inch and a half. So we're going to hit Continue, and you're going to see that every module is now going to head towards maximum depth. And I've had guys ask me, why go into maximum depth? Is it because we need to know the span? Is it because we need to know the range? It's actually a lot simpler than that, you know? The reason that it goes to maximum depth is because when it's at maximum depth, there's no weight on the gauge wheels. So I can just be lazy and slide two by fours under the gauge wheels. I don't have to lift the planter. I don't have to do anything. I can just slide those two by fours right under the gauge wheels. So we're going we're gonna to calibrate here. And when we hit calibrate, each one of the modules is going to individually work their way back up until they find that 2x4. And once they find that 2x4, we will know for that row, for that gauge wheel arm, for that opening disc, for that, t for that mustache, that that is an inch and a half. So for the rest of the year, that row is going to adjust off of knowing that that's an inch and a half. So we would end up calibrating maybe once a year. If we changed out our discs, we would calibrate. If we changed some of the hardware on the row, we'd calibrate. But really, it's a once, of, once a year. So then I got an easy question. Why do we go back down to the maximum depth afterwards? Pull the boards out. That's right, exactly. Because uh, 
I really don't want to have to spend much time on my belly. So if we go back to the app here now, now that we've calibrated, and we look at rows 6, 7, and 8, we see in the cal factor that there's a full half an inch difference between 1.18 and 0.66 and 1.16. So for the, if we'd have gone out to the field with T-handles on this planter, rows 6 and 8 were going to be a quarter inch shallower than the T-handle setting, and rows 7 and 9 were going to be a quarter inch deeper than the T-handle setting. So the other thing we now have the ability to do is now we have the ability, let's go ahead and go to the PowerPoint, we have the ability to adjust our depth from the cab. So for whatever reason, if we're in the field and, and we see that we don't like the depth we're at, rather than having to get out and adjust the T-handles, just from the push of one button from our screen, we can now adjust down a half an inch or down a quarter inch, or we can come back up and we can adjust as well. But like I said, the, the part that gets us most excited is really combining smart firmer with smart depth. Now in order to do that, we're only going to ask three pieces of information. And those three pieces of information are going to be unique to your operation. We're going to ask you, what is the minimum depth that you're comfortable planting? And so you're going to put that into 2020. What is the maximum depth that you are comfortable planting? And you'll put that in. That's going to define the guardrails. Smart depth won't go shallower than that, and it won't go deeper than that. And that could change. That could be different for each person in the room. And then we're going to ask what mo moisture target that you're aiming for. In this slide here, we're planting corn, so we're going to aim for that 30% furrow moisture. Now, if we are planting cotton, we would shallow up the minimum and the max, maybe to a half inch and three quarters of an inch, and we actually want to put the cotton in dry so that the rain brings the moisture and we germinate off of a rainfall, so we're going to set the target moisture maybe to 10 so that we, it's dry. So we're going to adjust these three based on the conditions and based off of the crop that we're going to put in. So let's show what that would look like. So we put these three pieces of information into 2020, and then we enable smart depth control. Let's give ourselves a little bit of speed here. So we've talked about this field last year at Winter Conference. Um, and, and this is a field that's about five miles from here. It's called Terhune. And there's a lot of variability in this field, both soil type as well as topography. There's an enormous drop off about halfway north south on the field. And on the north side of the field, up on the hill, there's a really dry, light soil. It really doesn't hold on to moisture very well. But when we get down into the bottom, we get into a darker, heavier soil that will hold moisture much better than at the top of the hill. So as we come into this field and we start on the north side, we're going to be planting into this light soil and the smart firmers are going to see that there's no moisture at our planting depth and each one of the smart depth modules are going to adjust down deeper inside of our range to get to moisture. So we come down off the hill and we get down into this dark soil that's got a lot of moisture in it and now smart depth is going to see that moisture and we're going to shallow up the planter staying into moisture but coming closer to the surface because this is a tighter soil. We don't want to pay that resistance to emergence tax in this soil here. So when we think about smart depth in 2019, we're going to be beta testing smart depth as we head into next year. And the, the reason for that is because we want to get smart depth into more operations across more fields, and, and we want to continue our agronomic learning so that as we come out to market with smart depth, it's really based off of all of the information that you guys have and that we have as we make those recommendations of where those settings could be for different conditions. So when we think about smart depth, for us it really falls into three categories that, that we're excited about. We're excited about the ability to have row-to-row -row uniformity, the ability that when we set it to two inches, that furrow sits at two inches and every seed ends up at two inches. And it's about in-cab adjustability, the ability to make adjustments quickly in the cab to save that time that Bryce was talking about. 
And then it's the moisture-based agronomy, to take the knowledge from our research, combine it with your understanding of the DNA of your field, and empower you with three simple boxes to be able to combine those two pieces of information into even germination, to even emergence, to maximize the yield potential. So I thank you guys for your time. Uh, if you have questions, you can come up and we can talk. Um, otherwise, the session you'll be headed to is down that way. Um, and again, thanks for your time. How you doing? Good. Good. Yeah. Good.